An April 28th article in JAMA Internal Medicine, Comparing Physician and Artificial Intelligence Chatbot Responses to Patient Questions Posted to a Public Social Media Forum, generated a great deal of discussion, much of it horrified. In particular, people are focusing on the study's conclusions that chatbot responses were longer than physician responses, and the study's healthcare professional evaluators preferred chatbot-generated responses over physician responses four to one. Additionally, chatbot responses were rated significantly higher for both quality and empathy, even when compared with the longest physician-authored responses. While this study is thought-provoking and has generated much interesting discussion, that conversation isn't focusing on the real root of the problem in physician-patient communication, time. That was Jennifer Lysette, a rural community hematologist and oncologist and writer in Oregon. She was reading from her recent first opinion essay on medical chatbots and empathy. I'll bring you our conversation about medicine, AI, and humanity in just a moment. I'm Jesse McWhorters, branded content editor for STAT. Recognizing the breadth and diversity of America's 53 million family caregivers, how can we better know and see these important unsung heroes? Lisa Wilson, Head of Caregiver Advancement Strategy and Experience at United Healthcare, offers insights. Family caregivers are a cornerstone of our health system, but it can be challenging to support them in the moments that matter. United Healthcare is breaking down the barriers to identifying and engaging caregivers. For example, we're making it easy for caregivers to establish necessary HIPAA permissions and encouraging self-identification. The more we know about this population, the more we see them, especially early on in their caregiving journey, the better support we can provide. For more information, visit uhc.com slash caregiving. Welcome to the First Opinion Podcast. I'm Tori Bosch, editor of First Opinion. First Opinion is STAT's platform for interesting, illuminating, and provocative articles about the life sciences writ large, written by biotech insiders, healthcare workers, researchers, and others. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here and for your wonderful article. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, So to get started, can you just give us your one-minute bio? Who are you and why were you interested in this topic? Yeah, I will try. Uh, So I am a clinician. I am a community hematologist and medical oncologist um, in rural Oregon, and I've been practicing in rural health for about a decade. Um, I've been a physician for a little over two decades. And the last decade, I've also um, gotten into writing, which I started out with narrative medicine pieces, and it really um, ended up being an exploration and sort of path back from physician burnout. Through that path, I actually started writing fiction, which became a creative outlet for me. And I had a, my first novel come out in March. It's called The Algorithm Will See You Now. And it's a speculative medical thriller, uh, near future um, AI. And um, I became interested in it actually back uh, in the 2010s when the um, platform uh, Watson, IBM Watson's Health, which a lot of people were familiar with it from uh, the game show Jeopardy. Um, There was a lot of excitement and talk about uh, the opportunities for that platform um, in oncology, specifically with precision medicine. And then it all just uh, basically fizzled out. It just really sparked my curiosity as to, um, you know, like what could go wrong <laughs> and um, and exploring that through fiction, but uh, really getting at themes of um, 
humanity and healthcare, as you said. What is it, do you think, that makes AI so interesting to you as a practicing doctor? So a lot of it, unfortunately, has been some of the downsides of what's happened in medicine, you know, in just um, the real life practice of healthcare in the past decade, which basically the increasing corporate mindset of healthcare, the mindset of those who are there to essentially make a profit from healthcare, which is the fundamentally at odds with why most of us practicing physicians um, became physicians. And then on top of that, the increasingly onerous uh, uh, insurance denials and my worry and what really sparked my creative muse is it was just um, envisioning uh, what if the wrong people are put in charge of it. And I think, unfortunately, that's what we're struggling with um, every day on the front lines of healthcare. Absolutely. So now I want to get back to your recent first opinion essay. So tell us a little bit more about this viral study about um, patients allegedly preferring responses written by a chatbot rather than by actual doctors. Yeah, well, it was a very interesting study. And I think um, exploring a, a much needed space that, you know, is likely um to be a possible use for AI. So, and of course I wasn't involved in the, in the study at all, but um, my understanding is that they wanted to look at uh, could AI be used to help answer uh, patient messages in the electronic medical record in basket, which uh, unfortunately is a big um, uh, workload for most physicians who aren't um, necessarily given dedicated time to do that. And, Patients then understandably get frustra frustrated when they don't get um, an answer right away. And so these authors looked at, well, uh, could uh, AI, uh, specifically chat GPT, be used? They, my understanding is they used uh, real world uh, patient questions that were entered into the platform Reddit. Um, which I will admit I don't use Reddit, um, but my understanding is that there is a subreddit where healthcare professionals who are somehow validated to be who they say they are uh, just go on uh, on their own time and answer questions from anyone who posts it there. And so the authors took um, those uh, questions and answers that were publicly available and then uh, ran them through chat GPT and then in a, a blinded way showed it to five uh, physician reviewers who then using Likert scales um, rated them. And so it is a, 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 you know, a subjective small um, uh, study. And so ChatGPT, for anyone who hasn't been paying attention to all this discussion about generative AI recently, is a platform created by the organization OpenAI in which anyone can sign up and then enter a prompt. And that prompt could be um, anything from write an article in the style of the New York Times, or it could be write a physician note saying that your blood results are back, right? So you basically you give the system a prompt and it will generate something for you, hence the name generative AI. And so here, as you're saying, basically the researchers took real questions that people had asked um, and then compared the results from physicians on Reddit to the results if the same questions were asked on ChatGPT, right? Yes, that's my understanding. And so... As you write about in the essay, the researchers and a lot of the responses to the essay were focused on this idea of empathy, that it seemed like chat GPT, which, you know, is incapable of thought, but can uh, sort of anticipate what a human might write in the same situation, was able to craft responses that were longer and appeared more empathetic. And of course, that's sort of shocking to us since empathy is supposed to be a human trait. But as you write, there's a really great reason why... Um, 
both in the real world and then within the study context that um, the physician responses might not appear quite so empathetic. So let's start by talking about why the responses might be a little bit brusquer in the real world. So as a doctor managing your in-basket, tell us what it's like when you're trying to answer answer questions from patients. Yeah, well, it's always a time crunch, unfortunately. And as I wrote about in the essay, I had a really illuminating conversation with some of my relatives who who are not in medicine or healthcare, and um, they actually didn't realize that most physicians aren't given like a dedicated chunk of time to read and respond to those messages every day. And so I wrote about in the essay how, um, at least how I do it, and I think how a lot of my colleagues do it is. Uh, when you finish with one patient and your medical assistant is rooming the next patient, um, you look at your in-basket and you try to quickly get through uh, the most urgent messages. Um, so it's just a constant back and forth throughout the day um, of just like mentally triaging, responding to the most urgent and, and saving the ones that are um, not emergencies until the end of the day, at least I do. So, um, I can have a little bit more time to respond. Um, whereas of course the, um, generative AI can, um, you know, instantly like write three paragraphs in like, um, three seconds. (laughs) So, um, so I think that also, uh, looking at the responses that they did share in the table in the study, um, I think it just didn't represent the real world. Like, um, like many of them are just sentence fragments. Like, um, I think one is just like, no need to go to ER or something like that. And, and these are the responses from the real doctors on Reddit, right? Yes, yes. So, and obviously the people aren't there patients, they don't know them, they don't have a relationship with them. Like if I was responding to one of my patients who was worried about something, I wouldn't um, just write a sentence fragment like that because I would know that they are messaging because they're worried and they need some reassurance. Yeah. I mean, generally, so I actually am an active Redditor, which is something I probably shouldn't confess to people, (laughs) but I I love Reddit. Um, I really enjoy myself there. I think it's a really wonderful community when you find the right places. Um, But it's not where I really go for empathy, especially on any of the advice sections, right? I mean, these are people who, as you write about, are maybe they're not actually practicing doctors now. You know, maybe there's someone who got an MD and now is doing something in administration, but misses a little client or a little patient interaction. Like, this is kind of like texting maybe your second cousin who went to medical school um, and saying, should I go to the ER for this rather than texting your actual doctor, right? You're going to get somebody who is giving you a really brusque, quick response, not someone who is thinking, this is me and my professional relationship with someone I see regularly, right? Yes, that's a good way to put it. The um, messages I saw that they shared in the table from the physicians did remind me of uh, texting, just like very uh, quick to the point um, minimum that you need to know for this. So, yeah, I mean, and one thing that struck me about your essay, and, and you get to this a little bit, is that you know, it, it seems that some of the response to the study, so like, let's say that forget the Reddit of this all, you know, let's say chat GPT really can produce more empathetic results because physicians are time crunched. You don't have the dedicated time to spend on your in basket that you wish you perhaps did. Some people are now saying, well, then maybe this means that physicians really should be using chat GPT to at least craft drafts of their responses. Um, But there's something like a little bit brutal about the idea that technology in the form of the in-basket and the electronic health record is partially responsible for physicians' inability to spend time with patients. And now people are saying that AI is the solution to the problem also wrought by technology. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that kind of techno-solutionism? Yeah, no, you, I think, phrased that perfectly, that it just really gives me pause because I think, and I'm certainly not the only one to say this, that we could use AI in ways to minimize that technical burden to give the patients the time back with their physicians and give the physicians their time back. 
Um, I think the other thing too, that I just want to point out, because I thought the authors did a really good job in the study is in their conclusion. They, they are very clear that they're not proposing, um, like this would be used without any sort of review. Um, so I just wanted to, to make sure to, to mention that, but even so, like I, I would much rather, um, you know, have technical solutions be focused on other things so that then I have that time. And, and I have to say like my specialty as an oncologist, which is cancer medicine, that, you know, that's a unique patient population. And I get to know my patients quite well and have a lot of longitudinal follow-up with them. And so the other piece for me with answering those messages is just that knowledge of who they are. And um, so while I think it's one thing to have a boilerplate sentence, like the thing that chat GPT has in the study in the table that they shared, which I think the irony is, of course, it, it was must have been modeled on real physician responses to learn what is <laughs> empathetic. But it typically starts out with a, just a reflective statement like, I'm sorry this is happening to you. That must be scary. And, um, you know, that that is what I do personally with my patients is, I, for example, if I, they're messaging me, they're concerned about a symptom. And I recall in the last visit, we talked about X, Y, Z, and I know that you know, ABC is what they're worried about. And like, I can reassure them that that's not what it is. Um, like a boilerplate empathetic statement isn't going to do that. Um, and, and again, like we talked about in the subreddit, there wasn't any of that, but I, I just really don't think that reflects real world, like how real physicians in our own panels, like respond to our patients. <laughs> And it also occurs to me, too, that, you know, we can usually tell when someone is expressing genuine empathy versus boilerplate empathy. Like if you call because your cable is out and the customer service person says, I'm sorry to hear that. That must be frustrating. You know, I know that's rote, right? <laughs> I know that is in their script and I appreciate the sentiment, but we all know they don't really feel that much empathy in that. And I suspect, too, if patients start to realize that these responses are being written by chat GPT, you know, then the empathy really doesn't feel the same effect as someone who knows that you're referencing their previous, their, the, something that you talked about in your last appointment, right? Yeah, I agree. I think that's really well said. <laughs> um, you know, I just, for fun, I, I did want to share one thing. I was on the medicine subreddit last night, and as I tend to to lurk on to, to get ideas for first opinion, um, and you might enjoy this, someone had posted a thread saying that they were thinking about using chat GPT to write patient letters about test results. And at first, I thought this is sort of what we were talking about here as a time-saving tool, but this person was actually using it a little bit differently. Um, they seemed to want to use it to write slightly goofy letters to patients they knew very well about normal results. Um, can I read you an excerpt of one? <laughs> yes, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> so the prompt was, write a letter to a patient explaining that their chest CT is normal in the style of the King James Bible. <laughs> And the chat GPT response was, My dear patient, hear ye the good news of thy chest, for in it no shadow nor harm doth rest. The Lord hath blessed thee with health so fine that thy chest doth shine with grace divine. Verily I say unto thee, thy CT is clear, no trace of sickness nor disease to fear. In thy lungs thy airways are free and bright, and in thy heart thy rhythm is strong and right. So I, this is weird in a lot of ways. <laughs> I actually can think of a few patients that would really um, appreciate something like that, but but uh, only if um, you had like cleared it with them ahead of time. <laughs> like, um, also, I'm no biblical scholar, but I'm pretty sure the King James Bible doesn't rhyme. Yeah, I, I, that's what I was thinking too. Is it, like, I, I mean, it's obviously. Um, 
a sort of archaic style, but I'm not sure it was biblical, but um, <laughs> it was clever. <laughs> it was. It was also just sort of one touch that made me think of a way that um, you could use ChatGPT, as you said, to in some ways in your practice without losing the humanity, right? I mean, for a patient who might enjoy it, that ki- that might be kind of fun, especially if it's clear that it was written by a generative AI. Um, as another poster said, you know, most patients just want a one line, you're all good, <laughs> and move on. They don't need the, the long thing. I think that's very true. And when I... Um send my patients results, especially on their imaging, because of course, in my practice, a lot of people are getting scans to see, um, you know, is their treatment working or if it's um, monitoring and they've been in remission for a long time. I think that fear of it coming back never goes away. And so um, we really realize that. And another stressful layer to our practices right now um, uh, is the immediate transparent release of results so that uh, patients often see it before I do. So when I add my message to them, um, I do try to just use very plain language up front, very clearly um, that this is okay, or this is a good scan. Um, And then I go into a little bit of detail, but I try to... um, really use that plain language right up front because I think, um, you know, many times uh, they're reading the report, which like I explained to my patients, like it's radiology lingo. It's really a whole additional language that we spend four years in medical school learning. So they will sometimes get very panicked about something that's just a, a normal result, but it's written in radiology lingo and they don't know what it means. So um, I think that, um that's that very clear message from from their own physician that, hey, everything is okay is really important. Absolutely. So you mentioned also that you think there are other ways that AI could help free up your time so you can spend more of that time crafting empathetic responses. What are some of the ways that you think AI could actually be helpful for you as a practicing physician? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's what everyone is exploring right now. And I'm not going to claim that I know the answer, but I think where it's focusing and where it's already been being used in some areas with success is the um, data sorting for the physician. I think that is a strength and I think is probably where the focus should be. Forgive me, but what does data sorting mean in this context? Can you give an example of what that might look like? Yeah, I think, again, nobody knows the answer, but I would say just, you know, I can just speak for my practice in oncology. And and this is actually uh, what they were trying to do with IBM Watson's health over a decade ago um, is, uh, like, for example, nowadays we do something on tumor biopsies called uh, molecular testing, or it's also called next generation sequencing, where... Um, the tumor DNA is sequenced to look for mutations that might actually um, determine uh, n- kind of niche treatment for individuals. And um, right now we get, you know, basically a report and then we, as the oncologists, uh, you know, sort uh, through that and um, that takes time. And so th- this is, again, what unfortunately, <laughs> what IBM Watson Health, uh, basically, in the end, it, they showed it didn't actually do a better job than physicians. <laughs> so it still has a lot of work. But and it's so interesting, because when I started thinking about, again, my book, which is purely speculative fiction, I it's like a backup to the physician. So like, um, for example, digital mammogram um, is also analyzed and uh, um, just as extra layer of patient safety. I, I think, you know, we talked about uh, data sorting, but that that's another place I think it could be used. And again, not not the primary, but, uh, but backup because, um, I mean, already in medicine, we have so many double checks built into the system, but if we add even a third layer and, and um, but I think, again, it's important that that, because there could be risk of false positive, like it wouldn't send an alert to the patient, but an alert to the physician, and then the physician could review and then um, 
you know, so, so like we're not taking out that, um, human, uh, uh, knowledge and experience factor. Right. You know, so they call it the human in the loop, right? So that in this case, the loop would be between the physician and the AI system, whatever it might be. The human makes the final decision with some input or at least some backup from the AI, and then the physician communicates it themselves, ideally, not written by generative AI to the patient, right? I, th- I think that would be preferable. <laughs> yes, absolutely. As a patient, I would agree completely. You know, one thing that strikes me about this is, so as someone who used to primarily edit coverage of technology, um, it's interesting that you say that you were first inspired to write this book back in the first wave, or I don't even know if it was the first one, but the first one that I was aware of, wave of AI hype, right? So I've been thinking a lot about Watson and how for about six months there, it felt like that was the future of diagnostics. And then everyone just sort of forgot about it and Watson became a little bit of a punchline. And now, just within the past six months, we've emerged in this new sort of hype cycle of AI in medicine. So I'm curious if you think that, you know, in six months, we might look back at what's happening now and say, wow, we all got really far ahead of our skis on that. You know, one of the things that was so interesting to me that I see now actually happening with um, with chat GPT is that in my research for the book, I, I, you know, I, I read a lot about machine learning. And, and again, I'm not claiming to understand it or have expertise, but just enough, um, you know, to be able to use it in fiction. And one of the things that fascinated me and that I include in my novel is this concept of machine learning hallucination, where, um, again, in my non-computer scientist way, layman's terms of understanding this is that, um, So the machine learning builds models based on the data it's provided. And if it's encountered with something that it cannot fit to the model it's made, it will sometimes, um, quote unquote, hallucinate a response. And there's been a lot of um, uh, people uh, on social media and online showing how ChatGPT is making up sources. Um, and so this is something that like people have, uh, gone on social media and said, like, chat GPT said, I wrote this paper and I didn't like they're actually, they're an actual expert in the field, but like chat GPT has made up a paper that they wrote, they never wrote. (laughs) And so, um, you know, any students tempted to use it to write their papers, um, well, they obviously should be aware for a lot of reasons not to do that. But, um, one thing is that, uh, their sources might be totally made up. And so, that just has been so fascinating to me because that was um, something again. Even when I was doing my research six, seven years ago about machine learning, was a was a caution of something that it would do. And and now we're seeing ChatGPT do that. And and so that of course is a big concern for um, for patient response. You know, allowing it to like interact with patients um, directly. That would be, I think, a very scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, it occurs to me that even the word hallucination is itself sort of misleading, right? Because if you don't have a brain, you can't actually hallucinate, right? I mean, yeah. there's no way that it's actually hallucinating. It's just, and this goes back to what we said about ChatGPT at the beginning, generative AI is just trying to guess what a human would say. So it's really just a projection rather than a hallucination. And I I think that's a distinction um, that sometimes gets lost, but an important one, nevertheless. Yeah, I once edited an article um, by Charles Seif at NYU who asked um, a generative AI to write an obituary for him. Um, Obviously, he is not deceased, uh, but ChatGPT made up a New York Times URL for his supposed death. Um, So it's a great example of... (laughs) Why you, you got to be very careful with uh, with what it's writing. So you know we've we spent a lot of time talking about the generative AI part of this, but I really want to go back to the the in basket and to the thing that sort of prompted this discussion in the first place, which is the way that technology is intruding in on your practice in a way that makes it harder for you to do your job. Um, can you talk a little bit about? what ways there might be to actually make your day and your time with the the in-basket more manageable without reverting to generative AI to to write the notes for you? 
I mean, it just comes down to staffing support. Like if I have a medical assistant and all that person is tasked with is monitoring my in-basket and taking out things that um, are not clinical. Like for example, um, people understandably, because they don't want to wait on the phone and the, the phone waits are long because again, our, everyone's staffing is down. So they message and say, Hey, I need to change my appointment from, you know, Thursday to Friday or what have you. Like, um, those kind of tasks being taken out of physicians in baskets. And, and I think most practices have that. And my practice has that, but my poor medical assistant has many, many things they're tasked with. Like, it's not just that. So they're not able, you know, to always get to all of those. Um, and then for, um, physicians, you know, what we call mid-levels who are nurse practitioners and physician assistants, um, they can be a huge help to physicians, um, either in helping monitor the in-basket or, um, you know, helping see patients so physicians can have a little more time for their in-basket. And the thing I think about all the time, and I think, again, it's because I'm actually old enough to have, um, been in practice before the electronic medical record to date myself. So the everything went to the electronic medical record. Like the transition happened, like as I was finishing my training and going into practice. Um, so, um, uh, I can remember what it was like before we had all that. And I was just thinking about this the other day because I sometimes have residents rotate with me and, so I was just thinking about this. I had a resident with me recently and like in between every patient we saw, like I was on my computer and they were on their computer and it just, I was like, gosh, like I'm not doing enough teaching because we both have like, because res poor residents, they have a continuity practice and they're um, responsible for their in-basket even when they're on other rotations. So it just, um, I guess you can probably hear like what I'm saying is I don't have the answer, <laughs> but I think it just comes with more staffing and more recognition that this is a big part of our jobs nowadays. I think that's where I was going with it, that like, even though our job has changed so much and now we have this, like it's not actually built into our day. We're still expected to, um, you know, for lack of a better word, just churn patients through the system because we've got somebody watching our our schedules and our RVUs. And we can't just, um, like, we're not in control of our schedules. I can't just say like, oh my goodness, I have 50 messages in my in-basket. I need to block out an hour so I can deal with these. Um, that's just not reality for physicians. It, it sounds like you're saying that the solution here is actually more people, right? To yes. have better <laughs> staffing and better clarity for who is responsible for what in a way that then can free you up to to spend more time with your patients, to spend more time talking to your patients, which is what it sounds like is what you like to do in your practice. It's very true. And and I will just share personally, it's one of the reasons I work quote unquote part time is because I do enjoy being able to communicate with my patients and make sure that I'm answering and getting back to them in a timely manner and uh, meeting their needs. And so I do um, work several hours, um, you know, before and after each clinic day. And I realized I can do that, uh, three days a week. Um, but I can't, I can't do it more than that anymore. And, um, because then even with being in clinic three days a week, then I have a fourth day, which is like, um, what we call like an admin day where I'm basically still working eight hours, but it's, it's basically all the, the in-basket work. And so, um, physicians who work four or five days in clinic are then doing all of that plus an extra day on the weekend. And, and it just, I think, as the authors in this JAMA internal medicine say in their very beginning of the paragraph, why they're even looking at this is because um, I think the statistic they quoted was like 62% of physicians currently are expressing burnout. And so um, it's not that we don't like doing it. It's that, um, you know, we're just human basically, <laughs> I, but I don't think that means we need to be replaced um, by any means. And, um, but yeah, I, I guess I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> well, 
Jennifer Lysett, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for all your great questions. Thank you to everyone for listening to the First Opinion Podcast. It's produced by Teresa Gaffney. Alyssa Ambrose is the senior producer, and Rick Burke is the executive producer. Uh, I love to hear from listeners, so please let me know which First Opinion contributors you'd like to hear on the show or what topics the podcast and column should take on. You can do that by sending an email to first.opinion at statnews.com. And if you have a minute, please leave a review or rating on whatever platform you use to get your podcasts. It really does help us a lot. Until next time, please don't keep your opinions to yourself. Thanks.